itself like little like forty five degree sort of things towards other like essentially kind of point your toes towards the camera. That helps out a little bit, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. We are back at the 2013 Global Breakthrough Energy Conference, and I'm your host, Jason Gravelli. We give the floor back to Jamie Janover, who's going to have a conversation with Android Jones. Thanks very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here at this conference. Uh, earlier today, I spoke about the Unified Field Theory of System RNA.
unified field theory that explains the structure and the dynamics of the universe on all scales. And I was happy to know that this conference was interested in having me speak on a topic that I am, you know, professional at, which is being a musician and also being an artist, and how the role of art and music has influenced the evolution of science and technology. And it's a, it's a topic that is uh, very interesting to me because I'm deep in explaining the science of unified field theory, and on a daily basis I'm deep in the process of my own artistic process of making music. I do photography and I do some sculpture work as well. And my friend here, Android Jones, uh, I interact with quite a bit in my you know, life of traveling around the world playing at festivals. Um, Android is a visual artist primarily and uh, uses technology to make his art. And so I invited him to come so that this could be a little bit more of a discussion and a back and forth uh, so we can talk about various mediums. Um, I'm a little bit more experienced in the musical end of things, and Android is a little more experienced in the visual end of things. But in the end, there's a very direct link and a synergy between art and technology. Um, you might argue that they're one and the same. Um, almost any type of art that is made interfaces in some level with technology, whether that be a technology that's outside of the human body or the technology that is us. Uh, you could argue that our brain is perhaps the most advanced technology that we have found in the universe, biology in general. The complexity that we exhibit just by existing uh, is unbelievable and mind-boggling. And obviously, you can do something as simple as sing, and you're making art with your vocal cords. Uh, music is as old as language, and it might even precede language. Uh, and then over a long period of time, as we've developed more advanced technologies, with that comes an evolution in the art and an evolution in the technology. On a broad scale, you could say that there is no evolution of consciousness without an evolution in technology. You might actually ruffle some feathers in the spiritual community uh, by saying such a thing. They might say, oh, I don't need technology. You know, I can ascend just by going inward and meditating and um, you know, accessing deeper realms of understanding within my own self. That is true. And at the same time, uh, the dark ages were pretty dark and they were pretty long and it wasn't very fun. And then we invented this thing called music and art and we had the Renaissance and it got a lot more fun and we were able to communicate ideas in many various different ways and evolution of consciousness happened. And then we were, got to the agricultural age and the industrial age and the age of information and the computers and internet. And now we can make art and share art instantaneously. For example, right before this talk, I took a picture of the sign out there with the schedule and I posted it to my Instagram feed and said, I'm about to do a talk with Android Jones and I tagged him. And so now we're, feet, we're streaming this around the world right now. So here we are in this, in this tent in Boulder, Colorado, but there could be a scientist in Antarctica watching us right now. It could be anywhere on, in the world. So we're kind of doing leading by example right now, just by what we're doing right now. We're, we're using technology to convey the art because uh, we're gonna show some art and we can now project this across the planet. Um, yeah. So it's an honor to have Android Jones here, uh, visionary artist. Yeah. Um, you guys hear me? Is that coming through? Yeah. Test? Yes. Okay, yeah. wow. Great. Hi, everybody. So my name is Android Jones, and uh, I've been an artist my whole life. I'm a native of uh, Boulder, Colorado. In fact, totally useless fact, but um, my father's farm was this property that we're all on what? right now. Yeah. <laughs> This, was this is original, where your father's farm? This was the original Jones farm that we're on right now. How about that? <laughs> well, then. Full circle. Back to Boulder. We got that curse. Anybody from Boulder knows what the Boulder curse is about. We won't go into that. Um, so as Jamie mentioned, I'm an artist. I consider myself now, after lots of thought-provoking pro-weaving and wrestling of what to call myself and try to, where do I place myself in the 
2,000 to really 90,000 year old conversation of our history, where I, where I place myself now is I'm calling myself an electro-mineralist. Um, that is the type of artist that I am. I'm an electro-mineralism would be the type of art that I make. And uh, Jamie made a really interesting comment about the tools and how they apply to consciousness. Um, for my own personal investigation of the truth, I've really seen that the tools are the extension of our consciousness. Tools that, as our consciousness does change or evolve, the tools are the manifestation of that. So they are kind of this bookmark of wherever we are. Um, I was trained as a classical painter, um, a portrait artist. I have an academic background, and 15 years ago, um, I got myself uh, my first Wacom tablet, and it was kind of my my my, my gateway drug into the uh, the digital realm. And uh, I kind of made a decision to never look back since then. But I've always been really curious about tools. I'm such a tool using little mammal. I love the tools, I love the technology, and so. Um, I started really looking at the, the history of tools as it applies to, to artists. So um, this is a 100,000-year-old paint processing workshop they found in a cave in South Africa. So this is the, the earliest known piece of art technology that we have. It was this small shell that they mixed pigments in. Um, I'm going to go through these really fast. This kind of takes us through the history of art in the last uh, 80,000 years. Um, you've got uh, uh, where... So, the, uh, I think the, the premise that I kind of came to is I looked through all the art that we have. This is uh, papyrus in Egypt in the 4000 BC. Um, this is paper, 105 AD. The majority of human creativity, this is canvas, it comes from cannabis, uh, for the past 10,000 years of our history has been dominated, completely dominated, by the vegetable and animal kingdom uh, for where we source our energy and our creativity. Everything was based around plant pigments or animal hairs or carving on a, on a cave. And where we are now in terms, when it comes in terms of like energy and how we make art, um, when we look at the, the modern tools that are available to us now, it's all a combination of basically petrochemicals and minerals. So everything we have here in my laptop is composed of iron and magnesium and sulfates and crystals and copper and uh, I find that you know when I really started to kind of investigate you know where does imagination come from you know what is it that that, that makes these ideas come into my head or my dreams and they really are electrical impulses they're biochemical electrical impulses that happen inside of my mind and so for me it really felt that having the opportunity um, I'm a, as an electro mineralist artist that my medium is electricity and my tools are made of minerals and petrochemicals, that electricity is the most pure form um, that I can convey my consciousness to, to other people. And like you said, with the advantages we have now of being totally networked with everyone, you can make an image, and I made a live painting from our show last night, and I shared it on Facebook today. So instantly that image goes out to thousands and thousands of people. And uh, I guess where this conversation brings me, where I'm the most interested is an artist's relationship to energy, because I see in the future that energy is going to become more and more important aspect. It's going to be an intrinsic tool for human beings to really communicate the, the deepest reaches of their creativity and in their inner world. We're heading to a place where the technologies we're developing are interfacing with plasma, which we now know is intelligent. In other words, Plasma self-organizes itself in specific ways uh, in the sun, and it's the most prevalent form of matter uh, in the universe. Uh, solids, gases, liquids, and plasma. Uh, and there's more plasma than anything else. And we now know that plasma interacts with our consciousness. And so maybe some of the art of the future and some of the technology of the future are going to be one and the same. Maybe a really very well-constructed uh, energy device that deals with plasma is going to be designed in, in a team or in consort with artists that are using the specific ratios that we observe in nature and then perhaps even controlling how this technology works using their consciousness and an artistic process of manipulating that. I mean, you could argue that, you know, dancers, it's a form of art, and when you're driving a car, you're doing a very specific dance. 
If you do the wrong dance move at the wrong time, you put that car into a tree or into another car. So we're actually all artists all the time, but we just don't necessarily call it that. And uh, it's, gonna, it's a very exciting time to be alive in general and to be observing the evolution of the technology and the evolution of the art and how the art and the technology and the consciousness and the technology are merging into one thing. Yeah, it's the most exciting time to be an artist in all of recorded history. There's never been as many opportunities for art. There's never been as many people that appreciate art. Um, there's never been as many reasons. And there's also been as, never been as many distractions towards making good art, mm -hmm. um, which is something we face, right? It's one of our biggest, our biggest challenges. But uh, yeah, as we, you know, I'm, I'm often thinking about you know, where is art going in the future? Where is the nature of energy going? And I think a lot of where I base my theories goes along kind of like the Ray Kurzweil and the singularity. Um, I'm very interested in the singularity topic as it, as it applies to creativity. Um, I'm not so much interested in, in artificial intelligence as I am artificial creativity and what shape that's going to form. And a, a lot of the reason that I make my art, that I make this digital art, um, it's my way of adding to this conversation and kind of kicking the can of creative consciousness down the road a little bit. You know, because we're going to see probably in the next 20, 30 years some really incredible paradigms being shifted. Now there's the conversation revolves in my world about if this is traditional art or digital art. And I think the conversation we're going to see in the future in terms of energy, um, the first epoch is going to be the cybernetic. So you're going to look at a piece of art and you're going to be able, well, was this made by an organic human or was this made by a cybernetic human? When you can have implants in your eyeballs that allow you to see gamma rays or you can have arm implants that allow you to, to never tire, uh, never get tired. This is a emotive device. This is a device that actually reads your, your brain waves. And uh, so we're, we're headed towards some really amazing and really interesting times where we're going to have to totally reevaluate um, how we evaluate what makes art, what makes art genuine, um, where does the role of the machines come in, what's the role of energy in this art, and, you know, is it going to be any good? You know, I think a lot of times where I'm always thinking about, you know, people are kind of making this digital versus traditional. Um, in the future, it's going to be, is this mark made by a man or is it made by a machine? And I think that's a, it's a, it's a much bigger question to start unraveling there. Because our, our relationship with, with technology isn't going anywhere. I think it's just really about evaluating the lines of development, whether our creativity is going to surpass or our morality on uh, how all these uh, new technologies come into our hands. Other than singing and maybe playing drums on your body, almost all art and all music involves technology. The most basic percussion instrument of picking up a stick and hitting something with it, the stick is technology. At one point, strings were the most advanced technology that we had in music. And boy, did that change the way we made music on this planet. And uh, now we have strings out of all different kinds of materials. We've got MIDI pickups that we could put on strings to catch the vibration of the string, change it into an electrical impulse. Now I can play my hammer dulcimer, which is an instrument that I've been playing for 26 years. It originated in Persia in the Middle East, over 2,000 year old origin, predates keyboard instruments like the piano by thousands of years. And now I've got it so I can hit it and just with a regular audio cable, without a MIDI pickup, a regular pickup, go into software that says, oh, you're hitting a G. So I'm going to trigger the MIDI note of that G. And now what sound do you want it to play? Oh, breaking glass? Oh, a dog barking? Oh, the space shuttle taking off? Oh, a symphony orchestra hitting a G chord? And now I can hit my dulcimer, and any sound that you can record in the universe can come out of the speakers. And so you know, the po possibilities are, are already infinitely endless, just in the world of music, never mind what Andrew is doing, which is a fascinating process. I want Andrew to kind of go a little bit into some of the stuff he talked about at our event last night of what he's doing in this technology. I mean, he can't, you can't make the art that Andrew's making without the invention of this thing that we call the laptop and the, and the tablet and the pen and all the, and all the stuff. So. Uh, and what Andrew's able to do in digital art land is truly phenomenal art that if you needed to try to paint with a paintbrush, 
you'd have an awfully hard time and it would take a very long time. And with Andrew and his process, he can take this stuff and in a short amount of time, go boom, 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 and you're like, wow, epic art. Wait, don't just jump past I'm trying the... to find a video to help. Sure. Oh. I can go through Look this at all this right. stuff. Wait, the Sydney Opera House. Wait, the... <laughs> so Andrew's got some big uh, paintings out here in the other tent that you've probably seen, but this is one of the more spectacular things that I've seen Andrew do in the, in the time I've, I've witnessed his process. So That was a lucky break. Really. Man, I was no. so psyched when you were there and you posted this. I was just like in my room like, yes, we've, we've arrived. Because, I mean... We're like, you know, from the same tribe in a, in a very specific crew of people that go to transformational festivals on the west coast of the United States and around the world. But Andrew's really leading the way of this kind of digital art revolution in music festivals and spreading this idea to the mainstream. So please just uh, explain some of how, how do you make that? Great. Uh, this is a piece called Union is in the Other Room. Um, it was a wedding commission by two friends of mine, Brian and Jennifer. And um, I've, I've done a lot of portraiture in the past. This is actually the first time I did a portrait of two people together. And uh, the reason I'm, I'm kind of showing this piece is when I think about what it really means to be an artist, if the job of an artist is to manipulate energy. It's basically what we're doing. And we have such an incredible opportunity. You know, what I'm doing, I'm just taking ones and zeros, basically, in electricity. And through the power of these tools, which are the combined efforts of hundreds and thousands of people over, over 20, 30, 40 years, um, I'm able to take these pixels, and uh, a lot of the art that I make, it, it revolves in this, this principle called pareidolia, which is the, when you look at a cloud and it looks like a, you know, a dragon or a tiger, you know, the mind is this meaning-making machine and it makes meaning out of chaos. And so all I really need to do is arrange these particular ones and zeros and squares of pixels in a certain configuration of shapes where your mind really takes over and does the majority of the work. Um, what I found really remarkable about this particular piece, I've been, I've been making lots of different pieces, and I print the work out, and I sell the work. By far and large, this has been the most popular image that I've ever made. Um, I've sold more copies of it. It's got a greater response. But what it really kind of, uh, what it really illuminated to me is the, the power that, that art has over energy. We, we talked about like making perpetual motion machines and trying to create energy. You know, this is a, this is a moment in time I captured over the period of the month. But every time I print this piece of work out, I know that it's just canvas, it's just this organic matter, and it's just ink and pigment on top of it. But when you place a painting like this into a white room, it transforms the entire energy of the room. Um, the people that buy these pieces are mostly lovers and couples and newlyweds. And every time they see this piece, it enacts this energy of love, which you know can increase, you know, it's a, it's a palatable increase in energy. It's not just emotional; like it'll increase their heartbeat or their pheromones. And I find it really fascinating how much energy uh, artists do have the opportunity and the potential to move with uh, with just. I mean, really get down to the base. It's intention and uh, and it shapes. And I just think that that's. I think it's just remarkable. It's one of the things that keeps me in the game of art all the time. Really trying to explore how far you can push that, and how to, how to, how to kind of turn and bend that energy in the most positive way for other people. That's, that's... What was that called again, that piece? His piece is called Union. So yeah, it's basically the whole universe is nothing but geometry. Everything happens in the universe, in the structure of the space that the universe is. All of our atoms are 99.999999% space. And so all art, and including music, which is creating vibrational sound waves in the medium of space and in the atmosphere, sound and light are being manipulated by artists. It's basically manipulating energy, manipulating geometry, and arranging it in a specific way that elicits biological, chemical, electro, magnetic, emotional responses in the person who's receiving that light or sound transmission. Uh, and so there's so many ways to do it, but now that we have, you know, the laptop computer, for example, I can hit my dulcimer, it can sound like anything. He can have a brush that looks like a hawk <laughs> and have a hawk brush or whatever he wants. Last night, Andrew was taking a picture of the monitor in front of me because it had this cool texture. And I was like, are you going to make that into a brush? And he said, yeah, that's, this is a high contender for becoming a brush. So I, I, I still, I want you to explain a little bit more about the technical process of, of how you make this stuff because... 
uh, for most people, I think it's a new form of art and it exemplifies uh, how much power and how much transformation happens with a new technology comes a whole new wave of art. Yeah. Well, what was particularly exciting about being a digital artist is that once you get a pretty firm grasp on the tools and there is a bit of a, a steep learning curve uh, to get into things, uh, once you, you know, once I actually, I think it really happened in college, um, I used to try to be a, like a, a, a photorealist. I was just fascinated with like perfection in art. And I kept drawing my hand every night. I draw my hand over and over and over again, really trying to get all, I used to dissect cadavers to understand anatomy, to get to the, the, the core of what we're all about. And uh, I reached this brick wall where I realized that, you know, I could spend the rest of my life with one hand trying to master it. And I could never really communicate the, the beauty and the molecular density of, of a hand. It's absolutely impossible to capture with lines and charcoal and little, pieces of stick on dead pieces of wood. It was just ridiculous. And so there's this huge liberation that happened there, and I realized that all I need to do is make a certain amount of shapes that enact the imagination of someone else. When that electrical, chemical process explodes in their imagination, you get them right to the brink, and you drive them right to the edge of their imagination, and they take it, and they just they can explode with it. You know, Once an image really seeds itself and in the imagination of another person is where it really comes to life. Not in a gallery or in a book or in a magazine, but really inside the conscience of other beings is where these things come alive. I've had a lot of response from people that'll see an image and they'll, that image will appear to them in their dream, you know, but not just this two-dimensional image, but like a three-dimensional, fully-fledged incarnation of a character that I draw will appear to them as subconscious, and that's the thing that really it really gets me excited, so um, I digress. Once you understand this whole shape game, and it's just shapes, there's no better way to manipulate shapes um, than digital technology right now. I can um, make any type of shape, any type of color, any type of line width. Um, I can paint with multiple colors. I can use uh, photographs as brushes. I could take a photograph of anything and I could smear it around. I could sample all the colors. I could sample the form. And so the only limits are really that of my imagination, which is sometimes frightening, you know, because, you know, you only have yourself to blame if it's not awesome. And uh, super liberating. Um, I don't get that. I miss the, ro the romance of, like, you know, smelling a tube of, like, red vermilion. But I don't miss running out of it at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Um, but um, I think for me, you know, it, it's, it's a, there's a fundamental um, kind of idea it's in place for me. Um, I, have, I have some pictures over here. My studio for the past two years um, has been, a, is, this is it right here, this is the Night Rainbow, and it's a solar powered, um, it's an ex-military delivery truck. And I set this thing up as a studio, and uh, all, my, all my power was coming from the sun. And uh, my friend Francois and I thought there's a fundamental difference as an electric artist when I was actually sourcing all of my energy for the sun. And I'm able to create all of these works in this really tight, com comp uh, compressed place um, because as, as close as the quarters are, you know, this monitor right here, this is my portal. This is my window into another dimension. And there's no rules here. Nobody can tell me what to do. There's no right, there's no wrong. It's just the liberation of my own consciousness. And I find that the deeper I'm able to get out of my own way, and let go, there's a, 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 an indescribable amount of energy that can come in through those points of meditation, those points of silence. Once you kind of get all the tools right, you know the tools, you know your anatomy, you know the form and the structure and the math, um, there's another energy that takes over there. And I'm sure that you're, you're, you're very familiar with this energy that I speak of, Jamie. Basically, I could say the exact entire speech that he just said, but I'm talking about music instead of visual art, right? Like you could take a sample of a bird and make it into your note that you play on the hammer dulcimer. You could, you know, take any song and change the key of it and speed it up and slow it down and chop it up and do all these manipulations uh, in sound, the equivalent of what we see here. So he's got a computer program that he's about to show us that have all these tools built in it. And now we also have audio software with endless uh, apps, uh, the equivalent of apps, right, where you can manipulate the tiniest little nuances of sound and combine it 
And so we're seeing the same thing in sculpture, where we've got 3D printers now that can 3D print physical objects that if you needed to try to make it yourself by hand, for example, my necklace right here, it's a 64 tetrahedron grid necklace, which is the foundational geometry of the fabric of the vacuum, according to Nassim Haramein. This is a handmade necklace from a craftsman in, in Bali, Indonesia, using silver solder. And anytime I show a silver artist this, they're blown away with the uh, amount of precision that this was made. It takes a long period of, of time, and it costs quite a bit of money. But now, you can 3D print these in plastic for $7. And so you could take objects that are very hard to make and 3D print them. They're looking at using moon rock to be the material that they put into 3D printers so that they can land on the moon and build a base on the moon using 3D printers, not having to bring any materials from anywhere else. So pretty much, we're starting to be able to 3D print things like hamburgers. You guys check that out? They've 3D printed a hamburger that is like a real hamburger, and you can eat it as food. No cow died, okay? You know what I'm talking about? So like, we can change our entire life and the way we live, the way we eat, using technology to make art. I don't know if a 3D printed hamburger is considered art, but maybe it is, right? I mean, what is art anyway? Yeah. There's something really incredible that happens within the feedback loop of art and artists and tool. Um, one of the reasons I was really attracted to the digital realm is I felt really um, just frustrated with the pencil after a while. There was so much that I wanted to communicate and I just felt like the pencil or the chalk or the brush, it was just like the, the bottleneck of all this energy that I wanted to get out. And what's really interesting about the tools that I have now, um, there's, this, there's this, I said there's this feedback loop that happens that when you become accustomed with the tool and the possibilities and you find out the new possibilities, it expands your creative awareness of what's possible. Um, I, I actually dream in the interface of this program painter. Um, the, the program, the, the marketing department just went wild with that one when I said that, but I really do. When I close my eyes or at night, I can actually see myself putting things together and I can put things together because of the tools in this program, where in the past, creativity was always just so linear. You had a sketch, you had an idea, then you made a thumbnail, then you had to work the sketch, then you had to put layers of tone on it, then you had to glaze over colors over it, but it was always this one by one by one by one, but um, with these new tools, spontaneous uh, multi-dimensional ideas are possible at once. And it, it just, it expands my own awareness of, of what I'm capable of and allows me to work uh, at almost several different points of the painting at once. Um, I'm showing this image as an example. This is a, when the, I did this at a workshop in India. Um, what I find really amazing about these types of tools is that I'm actually able, I found that it's actually the most freeing to not have any expectation when I start a piece of art, a uh, piece of digital art, because there are so many possibilities that I can go into. If I try to predict where I'm gonna end up, I just limit myself. But what I find is there's a, there's, a, there's a compounding of creativity that happens. There's different, one decision will lead you to another decision, to, and the, the ideas, it's not just one idea you come up with, it's this, like, just this, like, this cascade of ideas that build on each other and build. I'm sure it's very much like you know, being able to make music in Ableton before when you were using a, a pencil and writing notes on a piece of paper. I think we take a lot of these things for granted, just how ridiculous the now is and the tools that we have. And I'm privy to a lot of creative tools that aren't even released yet. And the thing that, that some of the things that are in the pipeline right now, you know, I mean, there's gonna be a time we're not even using hands anymore. You know, that's amazing. You're just about. using your eyes to paint at some point with the Google Glass st style eye tracking technology. Mm -hmm. I like how you put the brick wall into this guy's cheek. Well, this is an this is exact example that I'm talking about. So I'm able, when I went through India, I took photos of, uh, I was in Varanasi, and it's, I mean, you just have the most amazing, filthy walls in India of any place I've ever seen. And so I took all these different temperatures of the textures, and I'm able to take any texture and kind of use it like a piece of chalk on this. And so the idea I had is this is a, this is a painting of a Nagababa, which is a, an Indian kind of a sadhu, it was an aesthetic, they're the spirit, they're the, 
They're the, they're the, 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 the defenders and the warriors of Hinduism. I uh, went out to the Kumbh Mela and I was just really just, just passionately struck by this new archetype. It's like part Buddhist monk, part pirate, you know, <laughs> part Rastafarian, but all Nagababa. Anyway, um, so this is an example I wanted to just convey like the ancientness of this Nagababa skin texture. So I'm using the, uh, the different wall textures I found in Varanasi. And then I start using some on the right and it starts, it was actually these, these bricks, it was a brick wall. But then I put the bricks down and my little pareidolia kicks in and I look at it and it starts looking like stair steps. And so from that idea, then this whole picture becomes this, this the scale of it just blew out of the water. And now his whole head is going to be this temple. And it's, it's from, from one after the other after the other, but if I started with a sketchbook, I never would have reached that conclusion. I imagine my work would actually be much more derivative in nature. And because with the, uh, the unlimited opportunities I have here, um, there's just, uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful uh, unpredictability and they call it kind of happy accidents that happen uh, with this type of technology. And the same thing happens in music. You know, you make a, you're working on a track and you're overdubbing something and you make a mistake. You go back and listen to it and you're like, oh, that's cool. Copy, paste, 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 paste. And then it becomes the beat for the song, like that weird little thing you made that like makes it go like this. I mean, you inspired Leslie so much last night that most of the night she wasn't out dancing. She was with her sketchbook in the back, like, oh my God, I forgot how much I love drawing. I haven't drawn enough. Andrew really inspired me. And she started, you know, randomly, oh, that looks like a flower. And she did the whole thing, you know, so. It's really awesome for you to be, you know, explaining this artistic process. The last time we did one of these weekend uh, shows that we're doing in, in Denver this weekend called Sonic Blossom, Andrew did a whole workshop on this program, and Leslie and I took it and got the beta version of the program, and like we're learning some of the tools. And I quickly realized, like, you know, you can make some cool stuff, but to do that, yeah. It's, it's, it's really not as easy as it looks when you're watching that video. Um, you know, Andrew took a long time to develop the skills to be able to interface with the tools. The tools are getting so advanced that, like he said, a steep learning curve, that's an understatement. Um, it could take you years to master the program. Uh, mastering Ableton Live, which is a program that people are using to perform and make music, it's so deep. And anybody who's a photographer and deals with Photoshop, it's so deep. There's like layer upon layer of, of ways to interface with it. And so it is like it's just the most exciting time to be alive, period, no matter what. And certainly that includes art. Yeah, definitely. And I think as far as this, something I've always just really been blown away by, even when I had a, when a, a, a piece of paper, um, as far as the, uh, the amount of energy uh, from an artist's perspective that you can generate, you know, the investment of a piece of paper and a pencil, that you can, the amount of value you can create, and value is a type of energy. Right. The amount of value I can create by having four or five hours alone with this program. I had six hours last night that I was painting, and I don't think I've sat down and painted for six hours in a, in a row, uninterrupted, without a cell phone or Facebook or anything for a long time, and I was, I was blown away about what I was able to accomplish. I just thought about the value of that. You know, and you really, and then, you know, price that out with the amount of electricity that I used yeah. for the six hours, which is minimal. You know, I think that it's, a, it's an incredible argument for uh, just how powerful art is and how, you know, when you kind of, it comes to making something out of nothing, you know, it's not nothing that's made out of nothing, but it's a very minimal investment for a, a huge return you know, when you have the time and dedication for the craft. And it's exciting to see how uh, artists are inspiring others and they're taking it to new levels. You know, uh, for a long time on this planet, no one could run a mile faster than four minutes. And as soon as somebody did it, it was like boom, 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 all these people could run a mile in four minutes. And then in the world of music, you have a producer like Tipper, who Andrew performs with live sometimes. He's known as one of the highest quality producers who knows how to make the sound just absolutely pristine and everything's 3D and it looks, feels like it's coming from different places. Now you can go on the internet and find tracks that sound as good, if not better, than Tipper and the kid is 19 years old. I disagree with that officially. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to play some tracks. Talk to Kamananda and see. There's a whole crew of kids that are coming out of Australia and other places that grew up from age 10 
listening to Tipper, just like kids used to listen to Jimi Hendrix, and they got a wah-wah pedal, and they were like, oh, that's cool. And then you've got all these unbelievable guitar player kids that are 12 years old who could play like Jimi Hendrix, you know? Well, so the stuff those, is happening. I call this artist Diet Tipper, and show me another Jimi Hendrix. No, I, I, I hear you, I hear you. I mean, but what I'm saying, though, is that the inspiration level of these amazing artists, the technology that they're using is now available to these kids that are using these apps and these tools from such an early age that they're creating art that if you just, you know, played an old track from the Beatles and this kid's art, you, you, you know, maybe stylistically you don't like them as much or that you, it's hard to weigh the value of these things. Yeah. But I'm saying that kids now that are really young have the ability to make incredible art partly because of these incredible tools that they've had access to since they were born. Yeah, if anyone has any doubts over the validity that the digital revolution will eclipse all creative forms of, of technology, just Google babies and iPads. <laughs> Seriously, I've seen babies look at books, like traditional books, and they're, they're trying to like move the page, like the paper page with their finger. And um, I do a lot of teaching, I do a lot of educating. I'll teach 40-year-olds, uh, 50-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 18-year-olds, and above 18 is actually the most difficult people to teach how to use these tools because there's just so many mental blocks that are there. There's these stories upon stories in their head, if it's real, if it's not, and it's just, they just lose it. Um, when I, uh, I, did, I do these, uh, these, uh, these Yuri's Nights where, you ever been to the Yuri's Night where in San Francisco, they, um, the, uh, they basically truck in like 3,000 inner city kids into this huge warehouse and it's kind of a tech demonstration, kind of like this, only for uh, first grade to sixth grade. And I set up these Wacom tablets with screens on it and I set up all my tools and all the different programs I use and the six-year-olds that get up on that, they don't even, I don't even have to explain what to do. They just instantly understand and it's, it's, it's effortless and it's natural. And every year as it goes up, I look at the six-year-olds and seven and eight, and once they get nine or 10, they're, they're, they're a little afraid to do it, and their friends are looking at them. They don't want to look bad, but you know, these young kids, they expect this to already be there. I, I work and I invest a lot of my time developing the new tools, beta testing out the new paint programs, trying to find more ways to kind of continue this creative conversation of digital art, because I know there's a generation below me that just expects this to already be done. Keep scrolling, because you've got so many great pieces of art. Yeah. You should just keep showing them. Let's, you want to talk about festivals a little bit. Um, another yeah. amazing aspect about, kind of when you talk about energy and being an artist, um, that I found, this is a project that I worked with uh, my friend Francois. Um, in 2010, I got asked by a festival called Boom Festival, which is one of the most well-renowned and respected uh, transformational international festivals in the world. They have about, about 35 to 40,000 people. And they create this miracle. They make a village on the uh, on the side of a of out surrounding a lake in kind of the middle of barren Portugal. And so they approached me because they were a fan of the art and they wanted me to make this main stage design for them. And I've and I don't even I can't I I have no experience building it. I didn't even own any power tools at the time. I came. I didn't even have like a. I didn't even have work gloves. I think when I came to Boom for the first time. And, but anyway, I had imagination, and so I started imagining what I wanted this main stage dance temple that was needed a, it was, gonna, it was a piece of technology that shredded the egos of 25,000 people with the highest technological function one sound system on the planet. And uh, what I found through this experience that it, that it was really about making images, using my imagination, and then when your imagination is on a page, it's a totally different beast because then you're able to share your imagination with other people. I remember there was a moment where I doubted myself in this project a lot because I've never been out here. There's all these surly Portuguese, like who's this young West Coast kid telling us how to run the festival and build it up. But I remember I built it all out in 3D and we stood in the middle of this huge field that was gonna be the dance floor. And um, I built it all in, I think I built it in Maya and I kind of lit it and I stood in the center of where it would be the, the very center pole. And I used this laptop like it was a little window into the future. And I moved it around and I rotated the camera with everyone. And there was this moment of like clicking where it's like, oh, got it. I got your idea in my head now. And I understand it enough not to argue with it anymore. 
and we're going to move forward with it. And uh, just that ability to, um, when you put something, you know, they have that saying, if it's, if, it's, if it's on the page, it's on the stage. The idea that all these things just came from sketches to cardboard to iron, back to sketch, back to a three-dimensional moving light and sound. We, this is a this, uh, star tetra, uh, tetrahedron. Um, it's all LED, uh, reactive to the sound, and we have 25,000 people losing their heads dancing to it. And it was all just some silly sketches that I started off with one time. Sketches I was, I was there. These people, that these sketches are what we're going to do. And uh, that was an incredibly kind of uh, powerful element. I know you and I devote a lot of our time to kind of chasing this festival dragon around the world and all the things we've learned from that experience. The festival thing cannot be underestimated. Uh, I think the average American who's, you know, just hanging at home and doing their nine to five watching television stuff. If you showed them pictures of this or you tried to describe what happens at festivals, they'd be like, oh, it's a bunch of kids doing drugs, ravers, wasting their time, like whatever, festivals. But there's a lot more that actually goes on in deeper levels. And kids transform their brains into what's possible. And the festival is an example of like how you can show up to a blank piece of land, create an incredible structure, a village, a community, a whole city, have an amazing time, transform people's lives, and then take it all down and leave, and maybe even leave it cleaner than when you arrived there. Um, Burning Man is certainly an example of this. Boom Festival is an example of this. And now these festivals have kind of grown across the planet and are becoming known as transformational festivals because it's not just music. There's workshops. I do these talks on unified field theory. Uh, you know, Andrew Jones and, and others are doing talks on art and people are live painting, they're dancing, there's performance, there's music, there's all these different forms of creativity all coming together. The guys who started Google met at Burning Man. So you can't really underestimate the power of creative people coming together and doing their thing all together. I mean, in a sense, we're at a festival right now. I mean, they call it a conference, but in my mind, it's a festival. It's a festival where people are getting up and going blah, 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 instead of boom, boom, bap, boom, you know? We're not playing beats, we're doing beats with our voices, but guaranteed, this could be considered a transformational festival. Not only are we transform transforming people's minds here, we're broadcasting it around the world, and there's people that are going, what, what's that program? Or wait, how, you can make what out of a coil to do what? And magnetics does what? Oh, those ancient temples were what? Hold on a second. And they're Googling away and then they go blah, blah, blah and talk like this. I guarantee you next year there's gonna be more than twice as many people at this conference. And it's because of us. And so we are very important seed human beings on the surface of this planet right now. Do not underestimate the power of each one of us to transform the entire planet. We're doing it right now as we speak. This is in a very important exercise that we're in, gathering in the same place at the same time and all doing our thing together and communicating these ideas back and forth. So festivals in general, yeah, it's very important. You gonna show more of that video? Oh yeah. I love watching these videos. In some cases, Andrew said last night, here's a video of three days of work in five minutes. And you're just like eating it like food. Please, you know, watching this is so awesome. Yeah, and that's another advantage to this medium too. It's like, what, what would you give to be able to see, like, see, a, see, see the, the Libyan Sybil being created? You know, if you could go back and look at these pieces of art and actually see the process. With digital art, you have the ability to not only can I, can I take this, can I capture my screen um, and share with other people, but it's an incredible learning tool for myself to kind of go back into that. I can kind of almost kind of self-critique or see the different parallel possibilities I've kind of gone in, in, uh, in one direction or another. And uh, so this is one where you wanted to have a bunch of animals, but you didn't quite know how it was gonna yeah, um, work out? This was a poster for a, a Chinese uh, nonprofit uh, to raise awareness for endangered animals in China. And so the challenge was kind of create some sort of connection between human beings and all these animals in China. And something, something that's worth mentioning too, um, as far as like the process that's kind of, that I, 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 I learned later in life is unique, is that I don't have a visual imagination um, at all. I don't know why I don't. I had brain surgery when I was 11 in my right frontal cortex and 
I just never was never really able to imagine things in my head anymore. And uh, it's uh, it's kind of a crutch, but you know sometimes your crutch just becomes your strength. And so because I don't have the ability to physically hold an image um, in my head, um, I'm totally liberated from any of my expectations of what the image should or should not look like. And I'm actually very motivated to finish the image because I want to see how it looks in the end. I get I get a big charge out of that, as seeing the final product. It's the first time I've seen it, uh, as anyone else has. And so a lot of what I do is that my pareidolia is like on steroids, though, because I don't have this imagination. And so when I see something, I can almost kind of project onto it uh, what's happening. And so, yeah, this is a little time lapse of that. So all these little characters have started off as little bits and blobs and little passionate strokes that my little inner meaning making machine um, just couldn't let couldn't let it couldn't let chaos just be chaos and I had to kind of make something out of it which is that's kind of life right we're all kind of making meaning out of chaos pretty much we, at some level or another if you're we're trying to do this together yeah if you want to experience meaning out of chaos at a grand level go to Burning Man and observe what goes on there because I, there's no way to explain to you what Burning Man is it's like trying to explain what it's like to go to India you know, you can't explain it. You just have to go. And uh, through these experiences of all these festivals, um, Andrew and I have, you know, also interacted in a social way of bringing people together to pool resources and create things. Andrew was an inspiration for creating one of the many theme camps at Burning Man uh, called Fractal Planet. And uh, it was Fractal Nation, then it was Fractal Planet. And it, you know, Next it's- Next year it's Fractal Universe. Fractal Universe. <laughs> And then we'll have Fractal Multiverse. And uh, because you know our universe is inside of 10 to the 79 other universes, like our universe is the size of a proton in another universe, basically. Um, and so, you know, we're able to like come together and, you know, all these various festivals from around the world all collaborate and unbelievable stuff goes on. Uh, and so it's not just Burning Man, there's a lot of festivals around here too. And, in uh, Colorado, I produced a festival called Sonic Bloom. There's a festival called Arise. There's Telluride Bluegrass Festival. There's great festivals just here in Colorado. Um, and no matter what style of music it is, as we know, amazing things happen when great minds that want to play and celebrate and create art together yeah. interface. I think, I think the real value of these events too, as it refers to artists and energy, is it's a really op great opportunity for just kind of a reset button. There's so much about the society that we were born into. We didn't make these choices. We didn't choose how the grid works or how we elect people that are that are in power. We didn't choose. You know, we're just kind of forced into this mess. And I don't remember signing a contract that I was going to do this again. But we're here. And we're trying to make the best out of it. And these festivals, Boom in particular, Boom isn't about making a party. It's about building a village with 200 people for two and a half, three, four months in the countryside of Portugal. And it's that it's the day right before the gates open is actually the most exciting part because. You just, you know everybody, 200 people, you know the electricians, you know the plumbers, you know the security, you know the artists and the cooks, and you build this, this kind of fantasy world, but through enacting this fantasy, um, we always, there's, there's a bit of that fantasy that becomes reality in our default lives again. And as far as Burning Man concerned, I've just always seen that as just the, uh, I try to see things in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a really broad stroke perfect, uh, projection. Um, I know the world isn't perfect, um, but I think it's, actually I think the world's actually perfect the way it is. I don't think we're really supposed, as we disagree here, you know, this whole transformational, transforming the what. Um, I, you know, I don't think it's a mistake that we use resources. I don't think it's a mistake that we have these little, you know, if, if God and Creator didn't want us, they wanted us to be sustainable, I don't think it would have given us opposable thumbs. Um, obviously we get into a big mess by doing that, but I like to kind of think that everything has a certain amount of uh, perfection in it, and uh, we can just try making things a little bit more per perfect one step at a time. I don't have any hero complex around saving the world or not. I mean, I think the world's going to be the world one way or the other, and I think while the world is the world, we can, um, you know, do our best to be part of it, you know, do our best not to hurt people and love people and make something great and try to create as much value out of our, our life and our experiences and our friendships as possible. That's because you don't have children. <laughs> you can talk to my ex-wife about that. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be absolutely fascinating here to watch 
what happens with our technology in the next five minutes <laughs> um, based on our understanding of the universe and proportions that we observe in nature. What's going to happen here, I think, is that we're going to learn from nature how to make technology that acts in harmony with nature instead of blowing things up to make energy. Because right now on this planet, as we know, our main way of making energy is rape planet Earth, grab some stuff from under the ground that was compactified with a lot of pressure over a very long period of time, and release that, that energy rather quickly in a cylinder by blowing it up with a match, like combustion, you know? Like our advanced technology to escape the gravitational field of this planet is to build a giant phallus and fill it up with a bunch of fuel and get some suckers to sit on the top of this thing, light the bottom, run away, and then hope they don't die as they escape the gravitational field, which they do sometimes, or they die on the way back. Meanwhile, we're basically stuck to the surface of our sphere unless we build one of these rocket things. As soon as we understand technology that deals with the gravitational field, then we're no longer stuck to the surface of the sphere that we're on, and then we can actually join the larger community that we're a part of. And uh, yes, I'm referring to this thing that we call extraterrestrials or aliens, which should actually just be called people, because they were around first, were the aliens. So I think that we are going to join the greater community that is out there. And can you imagine the kind of art that exists in the galaxy? I mean, they're probably looking at us like, oh, cool, what's on today, honey? Oh, it's still the seven billion stooges on rerun. <laughs> I feel like we're a giant reality television show for the galactic family. Yeah. I think the really that it's the art that we create that's actually the only really interesting commodity that we have. Yeah, we're the know? we're the highest rated planet in the galaxy right now. It's like, are they gonna make it? Who's gonna get voted off the island? How about this? I say I say no one gets voted off the island. We all ascend together. What do you think about, it? you know? Yay. Yeah. And I have a feeling that ascension is, is not just figurative, it's also literal. Like, you can ascend like this, meditating, until a tidal wave comes and you drown. You might want to ascend with your body, which probably doesn't involve doing this. It involves building a type of technology that allows you to ascend, literally, off the surface of the sphere so that we can join all the other civilizations in the universe that have already made this transition. If you see a ship up there, that civilization, whoever's in there, was able to get to the point where they evolved their consciousness and their technology to the point where they could ascend and join and watch what's going on. And I think that we are about to uh, join that community. Disclosure is happening on a daily basis. You are disclosure. No one else is going to do it. It's you guys that are going to do it. And so together, we're expanding our consciousness and our art to include the fact that we're in a much bigger sphere than this little tiny rock that we're floating on right now. So uh, I, I'd like to thank very much uh, the Breakthrough Energy Movement for doing this at all, for considering the role of art and music in, in this type of context, for inviting Android Jones and myself, Jamie Janover, to present for you guys. And uh, Android and I will be doing this same talk tonight at Cervantes Masterpiece Ballroom in uh, Denver at uh, about 8.15 until 9 o'clock, and then there's two rooms of electronic music happening, including Random Rab, a band called The Works, Kyla Scintilla from Australia, and a bunch of great producers. It's a kind of intentional bass music. Very approachable music. My mom loves Random Rab. <laughs> and Android did, the, musicians. Android did the album cover for Random Rab's album that came out two days ago. The day that it came out, it made the top 10 iTunes electronic music chart. So you should come down and check this music tonight. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for again. Your time. And thanks to everybody watching out and starting out. Thank you. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Good work. Great. Not bad for improv. Yeah, not bad for not practicing. <laughs> yeah. We just started talking. There it is. E-M-E-K. That's all he goes He does uh, handwritten art. Mm -hmm. Similar to mm -hmm. how you're doing. He does stuff for every rock band. Oh, every really? Band. Absolutely. Like it's such a pleasure to be here and do this. Oh, cool. It's so great. Thank you.